I want to take us right down to the ground from the heights of aspiration uh, that Richard was just uh, talking about, down where I live with the lawyers. And, uh, <laughs> And, and, and I want to begin uh, by, by noting that Richard uh, spoke of General uh, Joseph Smith, as he often referred to himself, uh, and, and he understood himself as a military as well as a political and a religious figure. And I want to pick up with the idea that war is, is often called politics by other means. And I want to pull us uh, further from that uh, to the other end of the spectrum and argue that law is uh, productively thought of uh, often as politics by other means um, and that lawyers often function as politicians using courts and legal arguments to accomplish their political objectives. Now even if you don't yet agree with me, bear with me uh, as I put together something of a history of law and lawyers uh, after Joseph Smith's murder um, uh, and the Latter-day Saints migration westward through statehood. So, so from uh, about 1846-47 uh, uh, through 1896. I'll be talking about the way lawyers functioned in territorial Utah, see what I mean, on the ground. Um, not only in official roles as prosecutors and judges, but also as a defense bar, defending, uh, 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 defending accused Mormons. In the end, the development of this talented legal community made a difference to the history of the territory and the church that made the Great Basin its home. They did so mostly through law and legal action not war and pillage, but nonetheless, they made politics. There are three sections uh, to my paper. The first focuses on a society virtually without professional attorneys. Perish the thought, right? <laughs> this section talks about why and how that came about and what the consequences were. The second section examines especially the 1870s and the change in approach that brought, brought lawyers into the picture both in Utah and in Washington, representing church interests as well as opposing them. The final section talks about the effects of this new legal community, which included Mormons as well as non-Mormons. In the end, Utah in 1896, when it was formally admitted as a state, looked a lot like other states. The Latter-day Saints had smart lawyers to call on as they navigated the 20th century, just as other groups. In that sense, I'm talking about a pattern of growing legalism, with lawyers prohibited from plying their craft in the first period, then in the second period acting, acting both for and against uh, uh, as defense counsel and prosecutors, and finally coming together to draft a constitution and assuming important posts in a new political jurisdiction in my final period. So what I want to argue is this isn't part of a, a more standard historian's view of an Americanization of Utah uh, for statehood. Uh, uh, instead, I want to argue that lawyers were key to the negotiations that brought resolution to a long and painful conflict. And in some sense, lawyers were indeed dangerous to Zion, whether they were Mormon or not. They helped undo tissues of difference that separated Mormons from Gentiles, um, uh, and they found common ground as they litigated in the 1870s and 80s. So I like to think of this as a legalization of Utah for statehood, a refinement of prior work based on research into the role of lawyers in bringing change. So I'm calling my first section Order Without Lawyers. Let me just quickly uh, uh, set the stage. Not having lawyers doesn't mean not having law. The Latter-day Saints were a deeply law-bound people right from the earliest period, but they were not enamored of the legal profession. Far from it. They shared their dislike of lawyers with many other Americans then and now. 
but they took anti-lawyerism to new heights and often mixed in with that uh, disdain for significant parts of the American legal system, especially the common law, not so much the constitutional law. I'll focus, um, uh, working in our chronological pattern, on Brigham Young, mostly, in this talk, in part because I'm particularly interested in this pattern in Utah, but also because his resistance to lawyers is so important to the unfolding of the story and the eventual rise of a profession that Young distrusted and even despised, the rise of that profession to positions of significant power in the ongoing governance of the new state of Utah. Um, uh, calling this section Order Without Lawyers draws on the work of recent legal theorists who argue that it's possible to have well-functioning communities without the presence of law. I think they, they've made a mistake there. They mean without the presence of lawyers. Uh, uh, they, they are talking about formalities of law and those who enforce them. Uh, and, and in that sense, um, they're arguing against the existence of lawyers. You see what I mean? People dislike lawyers at all <laughs> uh, periods of American history, but I consider myself lovable, right, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. So Brigham Young would have agreed with these scholars about uh, order without law, and if Joseph Smith focused on harmony as a political virtue, then Brigham Young considered the essence of what lawyers did as bringing disharmony and discord. Uh, uh, and, and many utopian communities and ideas draw on this idea that lawyers bring trouble. You can hear it all the time. You know, once the lawyers get involved, the divorce turns ugly, and it would have been friendly before that. This is a common theme, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but I, I just want us to notice it. So Young was deeply opposed uh, to lawyers, litigation, and especially the common law, the English legal inheritance uh, uh, of the United States. Lawsuits between Mormons were strongly discouraged. Young especially condemned litigation as, and here I'm quoting, an even evil that opens a wide door when indulged in for the admission of every unclean spirit. Mm. Among the first acts of the Deseret legislature was a passage was passage of a statute forbidding collection of lawyers' fees. Mormons were encouraged in the strongest terms to bring disputes to the local bishop who would resolve the disagreement or send parties on to the ecclesiastical courts, a ghost court system run by the church that handled the nuts and bolts of internal dispute resolution throughout the territorial period and even beyond. Litigation between Mormons and non-Mormons was handled by the local probate courts whose jurisdiction was extensive. Usually probate courts, we think of them today as handling questions of wills, estates, guardianship, and so on. In Utah, the Mormon-controlled legislature granted probate courts the power to hear, hear all civil as well as all criminal cases. Probate judges were elected to four-year terms, and in many cases, the local bishop and judge of the ecclesiastical court was also the probate judge, so you could change hats in, in various different places. These courts also drew up jury lists. The legislature also expressly prohibited the courts from citing precedents from any other jurisdiction and in particular, legal technicalities were to be avoided. As Young put it, lawyers and their technicalities were specious, pretentious, and servile, keeping the people hostage to, quote, the musty rubbish of ages gone. Yes. <laughs> the extraordinary power of these probate courts were a recipe for charges of partiality. Mormon control of judges, juris, juries, and of course the prohibition of lawyers led Mormons to conclude, non-Mormons, excuse me, to conclude that they could not get justice in these courts. 
In particular, selection of juries through probate courts guaranteed that no jury, even those impaneled in the federal courts of the territory, would enforce anti-polygamy law laws. Federal judges sent to Utah, as well as non-Mormons in the territory, complained, le complained loud and long about the futility of attempting to enforce these laws. By the late 1860s, even federal judges acknowledged that the first anti-bigamy statute passed in 1862 was now a dead letter, as they called it, in Utah. Mormons replied that the law was unconstitutional anyway, so lack of enforcement was just evidence of the law's fundamental invalidity rather than their own lawlessness. You can see, and away we go, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, for 20 years, Mormons had the best of this argument, and some scholars have claimed that the law dealt by the probate courts was rough, but also roughly fair. Lawyers, of course, were always and passionately opposed to the probate court system. These included ambitious young men, <coughs> excuse me, who came to Utah during or after the Civil War hoping to build careers in mining law and found themselves a despised micro minority within a small but larger and embattled non-Mormon community in Utah in the 1860s. Even more, territorial officials who were hired by the federal government and told to go to Utah and enforce the law found themselves frozen out. Their livelihoods depended on persuading Washington that they and legal process, right, rather than the army, politics by military means, that legal process was the best way to save Utah and its benighted inhabitants right, from the clutches of religious fanaticism. These federal officials were natural conduits for anti-polygamy. Their presence in the territory both reflected anti-Mormonism in the East and then in turn bolstered it further, um, uh, especially when they uh, pointed to departures from the law and practice in the rest of the country and broadcast their complaints back to Washington and so on. It becomes a cycle. The order without lawyers that Mormons hoped to create looked more and more to the outside world like a society gone badly wrong and something had to give. So I call my next section, Lawyering Up. <laughs> <laughs> Gradually, it became evident that Defense of Zion required legal expertise, pressure from Congress and territorial judges, including the revocation of the incorporation of the church, indictments of Brigham Young and other Mormon leaders for lewd and lascivious cohabitation, legal proceedings against Mormons for polygamy and the Mountain Meadows Massacre, and in the end, very complex litigation surrounding Brigham Young's estate, all contributed to the development of a legal strategy to defend the church. Lawyers soon followed both Mormon and non-Mormon, as debates over Mormon distinctiveness and religious rights flowed into legal channels. By the early 1870s, Brigham Young himself had been arrested, sued for al alimony by an estranged plural wife. His adopted son, John D. Lee, had been excommunicated and was under investigation for his part in the Mountain Meadows Massacre and the jurisdiction of the probate courts and their powers over jurors had been sharply reduced by new law from Washington. These setbacks occurred as Young himself lost some of his edge to old age. He died in 1877. His opposition to lawyers had long deterred young Mormon men from pursuing careers in the law, but now Young began to relent. The career of Franklin Richards illustrates the potential and perils created by Young's conclusion that now he needed loyal Mormon lawyers. Richards recalled 60 years later that Young took him aside as a very young man and advised him to study the law. After he read 
alone, in other words, he had no one to mentor him, Richards was admitted to the bar in 1874. He, he was the first fresh Mormon face among a growing non-Mormon legal community. Richards served as general counsel to the church for 30 years and was, <coughs> excuse me, perennial co-counsel on briefs to the United States Supreme Court, often appearing at oral argument as a backup to whatever, you know, fancy hired gun sitting senator or whoever the church had hired to argue a case at the Supreme Court. He and his uh, firm defended prominent Mormons at trial and on appeal in Salt Lake and Ogden as well. Now, Richards never took a plural wife. Instead, he quietly but consistently resisted polygamy, remaining monogamous, a practice, he argued, uh, uh, that helped promote um, uh, 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 cooperation and economic uh, development in the state. Richards was so successful at mediating between Mormons and federal officials that eventually he became the law partner of former prosecutor Charles Varian, who was widely attacked by the Mormon press in the 1880s as a virulent anti-Mormon. In other words, these people worked across the street. Um, you know, they, they, they would cross sides very comfortably. Other Mormon lawyers followed a similar path and gradually built an articulate and successful defense bar. Joseph Rollins, for example, hung out his shingle in the mid-1870s and handled many complex and delicate matters for the church, including polygamy defense work and parts of the litigation surrounding the Brigham Young estate. Rollins was also a monogamist, and he took the leading role in the establishment of the Democratic Club of Utah in 1884. Several other young lawyers were prominent members of the club, among whom, <coughs> excuse me, were Richards and others whose names uh, appeared frequently as defense counsel in the flood of anti-polygamy prosecution that dominated the life of the territory by the mid-1880s. The Democratic Club's official platform includes uh, this statement, quote, we firmly repudiate the idea that any citizen is under obligation to take his political counsel from those who'd, whose avowed purpose is a continued violation of law. That is, this organization that included leading young Mormon lawyers departed sharply both from the admonition commonly attributed to Young and his successors and advisors that polygamy must be defended at all costs. Instead, this political club endorsed obedience to law as the means of advancement. So let me, let me come to my third section, which I'm calling the bar and the brethren. Isn't it ironic that lawyers are called the bar, right? <laughs> Anyway, ironically, the prominence of these young lawyers within their profession was achieved through defending in court a practice that they did not follow in their private lives. Like the trained professionals they were, though, Richards and other lawyers crafted plausible legal arguments in defense of their clients, and they had impressive wins forcing prosecutors and judges to craft, craft new and far less devastating methods and strategies. Yet most of the lawyers in this story did well, Mormon as well as non-Mormon. And I want to point to the exceptions that kind of prove the rule, which are two older lawyers, Aurelius Minor and Zerubbabel Snow. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. That's how we say it, okay. Um, uh, they had both faded from view by the 1880s, and Minor especially was despised by the federal bench. He had been, he had been uh, a relatively active a practitioner. Eventually, he was found guilty of unlawful cohabitation in 1885, and he served six months in prison. He was then disbarred from legal practice 
but his professional biography doesn't even mention the conviction. Aside from a few incidents such as Miner's conviction, the legalization of Utah was swift and it was successful. Utah went from a territory where lawyers' influence was banned in 1851 to a place where lawyers called many of the shots all in about 35 years, a generation, in other words. In his great study of the territorial Southwest, the Yale historian Howard Lamar remarked mm -hmm. on generational differences in Utah in the late 1880s. He argued that the Latter-day Saints, who had begun in the 1830s with a useful and a youthful, excuse me, and physically powerful uh, 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 leadership, were now governed more by graybeards, wise old men. Wilford Woodruff, for example, was 82 years old when he became church president in 1889. Uh, George Q. Cannon was 20 years younger, much more modern than Woodruff, but the guys I'm talking about are 40-somethings. Uh, 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 Richards and uh, Rawlins and so on, These, this coterie of lawyers uh, uh, in the 1880s were the ones who ushered in a new age of professional specialization, a far cry from the sort of jack of all trades that someone like uh, Can Cannon uh, and their earlier generations were. I also want to pick up on Lamar's focus on change across generations uh, and emphasize the profession that marked these men as thinkers and actors in Utah. The lawyers managed reconciliation there, helping craft a workable framework for government. What they eventually settled on was a draft constitution that closely tracked the structures of government in other states and were a product of lawyerly thinking and that have consistently placed lawyers in positions of power. The pattern is a familiar one to students of American history. The historian John Murren of Princeton studied colonial Massachusetts and found, <coughs> excuse me, a roughly parallel track for legal culture there and for the culture of legalism with, this, with its embrace of formality of argument and procedure, clearly defined standards and precedents and so on. And just to give you a sense of how well this worked for the lawyers, I just double checked yesterday to make sure I was right. 26 out of 44 United States presidents have been lawyers. 45% of Congress currently is composed of lawyers. Uh, more than quadruple the next largest profession. When the Constitutional Convention in Utah convened in 1895 to draft the document that would finally admit the territory as a state all of our lawyers were there. These leading members of the Mormon Defense Bar met with prosecutors and judges who had sent Mormon polygamists to jail and excluded all Mormon men from jury pools. Mm -hmm. Together, they buried the political and religious differences that had been so divisive only two decades earlier. As a group, with a shared vocabulary and shared goals, these men figured prominently at the convention convention and replicated, as I said, the basic structures of other American, uh, uh, American governments. Um, they resolved the fundamental question that had so dominated Utah uh, history, ending the battle that had created the bench and bar and brought them, the lawyers, to power. Polygamy, they concluded, would forever be a felony in Utah. But if the lawyers and legal profession generally were the beneficiaries of the long and bitter anti-polygamy campaign, there were also clear losers. And I'm not going to talk about the most obvious ones, the poor guys who went to jail. Let me po point to some other ones, uh, because we often don't remember uh, their losses. The focus of the campaign against polygamy gradually yet steadily excluded women. In the 1870s and even the early 80s, women's organizations could realistically be considered the vanguard of anti-polygamy activism and equally important to its defense. 
Women such as Ann Eliza Webb Young, who divorced and claimed that alimony I was talking about uh, against Brigham Young, and then went on a spectacularly successful nationwide lecture tour, and Angie Newman, who campaigned for an industrial Christian home for escaped plural wives, found themselves sidelined over the course of the 1880s. Anne Eliza um, was a sensation when Brigham Young was uh, alive and powerful, um, uh, and Angie Newman argued strenuously that women should have a refuge from patriarchy, as she constantly called it. But once the prosecutions began in earnest, both women lost their public following. Anne Eliza Young's career collapsed in the 1880s, and she fell into such obscurity that even her place and date of death are unknown. Angie Newman was outraged. She, she just sputters. You can read it on the page. When she learned that the industrial home she had fought for and which was supposed to temper justice with woman's mercy was in fact turned over to men the moment it was built. You guessed it. The three territorial judges and the federal prosecutors, all lawyers, made up the board of the home together with the governor, Caleb West. Yup, another lawyer. Within three years, the industrial home became not a refuge, but a poorhouse. And within just over six years, it had closed on the unanimous recommendation of its all-male governing board. Another group of women also lost in the shift from, uh, to law as the primary vector for anti-polygamy. As is so often the case in criminal trials, the purported victim gradually faded from public view. The actors in these prosecutions, uh, both uh, defense and prosecutors, were exclusively male. It was men who accused, tried, and defended other men. And I don't want to minimize the suffering of Mormon men who were sent to prison for living their religion. But the battle against polygamy had begun under the banner of the protection of women in a democratic society, women's respect, and so on, as essential to an American state. And it was defended in the early days on many of the same grounds, like defenses of polygamy argued on its superiority, the capacity to guarantee a husband for every woman, on motherhood, the duties of men to their wives, and so on. The project Prosecutions of the late 1870s through the early 1890s exposed women to the law, not only because their husbands were incarcerated. Women were called upon to be witnesses in thousands of cases. They struggled to be loyal and faithful, and yet also to tell the truth. Often, they failed to, man to manage these contradictory mandates. Dozens of women were prosecuted for perjury. Hundreds more perjured themselves out of desperation. Mormon women became known as liars. Almost 200 women were also prosecuted for fornication, a crime typically reserved for prostitutes and the odd serving girl who got pregnant on the job. In territorial Utah, women who were understood in their communities as upstanding and face, uh, chaste were charged as fornicators. They have been left out of the historical scholarship and even accounts at the time, an oversight that no doubt reflects the shame of the fornicator label, but that should not be replicated through historians' focus on men alone. <laughs> Last, and I promise to circle back to this so you know I'm winding up, is the army as a loser. It was a constant presence in the background, sometimes in the foreground, such as in the Utah War of the 1850s. Most of the time, Mormon defendants and territorial officials avoided violence. Both had strategic interests in avoiding the armed intervention that would surely follow outright violence. Mormons knew well, not only after the Utah War, but even more centrally after the Civil War, that 
open rebellion or even sustained rhetorical challenge to the power of the national government could not be a winning tactic. Mormon defendants and the church as a whole were committed to a policy of resistance that fell just short of provoking martial law. Territorial court personnel had a related interest. They wanted to keep law rather than war the means of political change because their jobs depended on the perception that the court system was the most effective and efficient, read cheapest. I am, I am, this is my final. But it's so great, right? <laughs> Lawyers yeah. are cheaper than soldiers. It's hard to believe. Means of dealing with, uh, uh, with defiance of federal law in Utah. In the process, right, all of these lawyers created connective threads between saints and Gentiles, establishing political as well as legal avenues for cooperation, even as they fought bitterly against each other in court. In the end, law and government in Utah followed well-worn paths, and we wound up with a political government that looks a lot like those in other states. Many scholars argue that conflict is essential to American government and constitutional structure. In that sense, lawyers who manage and channel conflict rather than harmony, for example, are predictable and even useful political actors. And what they did was bring Utah politics firmly into the standard and, and much complained about control of lawyers. Thank you. Thank you.